each other's as well. Amen. So, we come to this story. This is the first recorded miracle. There were other miracles. We know that because the Bible says uh, the apostles, as they prayed and as, as, as the Holy Spirit filled them, that great and mighty works were being done. Many things were happening. So the Bible already tells us that. But as we've seen, the Holy Spirit, who is the, the author of this book that we call the Bible, God's Word, he inspired Dr. Luke to record this event in all the details. And we're already seeing why um, this event was chosen. There are all sorts of things in this in this story that speak to us. It's, it's, it's so much more, it's much, much more than just a, a history lesson from the past. And so we continue with this this morning. Um, do you still remember it? Hope so, okay. Um, so power, preaching, persecution, and prayer. This is the first miracle. We have, we've done the first two acts in this story. How does it begin? And if you're following, this is at the very top of your page on the back side. Um, if you're, the front side is just for reference, and you'll go back on your own and read some of these things. But you can, if you want to, we're starting at the, it's at the top. If you want to fill in these blanks as we go through some of the, the, th the first three acts of this story. So Acts 3 describes what? The power of God. The power of God in the healing of the lame, uh, of, the, of the crippled beggar. But you can't just pull this story, we can't just pull this story out and say, okay, God's power was there. Remember that there's a foundation and there's a backdrop for all of this. When we look at the earlier chapters, remember, they were praying together. They were devoted to prayer. They were meeting together. They were fellowshipping. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. So there's the preaching of the words of God. They were taking it into their lives. They, had, they were in prayer, in fellowship, in harmony, in unity, in sharing. And then on that wonderful day, as, uh, as, they, as they were involved in all that, waiting on the Lord, waiting for the promise of the Lord, He poured out His Holy Spirit on Him just as He said He would. God keeps every promise he makes to each one of us and if the promise of God that he has spoken to your heart not just oh I pick up the Bible I've got this promise I claim it I don't think that's what God means in his word when he talks about the promise of, uh, promises of God that he speaks to our heart there is a word that he speaks and we know God this is your word applied your promise applied to me applicable to me in this situation and this time and when you have heard that and when you and you got to wait on God for that and you got to call on God for that when we hear that when we know that and God can do that as we're digging in his word anyhow you stay in the word you're looking in the word you're, you're feeding on the word the Holy Spirit he breathes life into the word and he will make he will make these things alive to you personally to you personally that's how God does it and if he has whispered and breathed some promises into your heart and life that have not yet come to pass do not give up don't get discouraged you keep on holding on to God and you keep on waiting I think sometimes we are so passive in waiting or in our prayers like well God has said it and I'll just wait on him and I think I think there are many things that God would work out in our lives and answers to prayers and answers to promises that he's put in our hearts I believe would come more often and more quickly if we in our prayers and in our waiting on God if we were tenacious we don't use that word much anymore do we but like as I said before like a bulldog you know those jaws they bite into something and they don't let go and God is looking God is looking for that are you serious about this prayer that you're praying ask seek not knock brothers and sisters as children of God don't stop at asking don't stop at asking brothers and sisters asking that's baby level that's baby level there's nothing wrong with it that is one of the levels but it's baby level it's it's a little bit like a child mommy I'm hungry the child gets food mommy I'm thirsty the child gets water there's an asking but as we are Christians and as we go on in him there's the seeking that's the following after God. There's the knocking. And there are things, there are things that we, we keep on going on to God, and these answers will come. And so they waited on Him. They were devoted to prayer. Jesus said, don't go anywhere. In a few days, I, I'm going to send you the promise, the, what I've promised you, what the Father has promised. And sure enough, 
the Holy Spirit was poured out. So as we look at this wonderful story this morning in Acts 3 and 4, that's all the background. They are, they are bathed in prayer. They're receiving the Word of God. They're full of the Holy Spirit. All of this is part of their lives as we come into this story. It's not just, oh, yeah, praise the Lord, I was filled with the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago and, or a month, month or two ago or whatever. Oh, God's great, so happy for the blessings and going on with their lives. There was a, a connectedness with God. There was a, there was a, as Pastor Rene has been talking about in, uh, uh, in his sermons these last weeks about I'm the vine, you're the branches, and this, this, this vital, Vital has to do with life, right? This vital union with God. Do you sometimes feel in your Christian life, I'm kind of dead? I, I feel that way sometimes. I, I just feel kind of dry inside. There's nothing, it doesn't feel very fresh. And sometimes it's sin, sometimes it's not sin, it's just we've been busy, we've been neglectful maybe. Well, that can be sin too, but, or maybe we've just been, ah, oh, we need, to, we need to be refreshed, don't we? We need to dig in. We need to drink more deeply. Um, and that's what fasting and prayer, that time that we had just a, just a couple of weeks ago, that's part of it. And he refreshes us, and there's a vital union. And out of this vital union with Christ come these things that we read about in the book of Acts. Really, brothers and sisters, th this is, it's out of this vital union with Christ. Um, and this is what God has for us, and this is what God wants for us as well. So, that's the background. So the power of God, that's the first thing that we see, the power of God in the name of Jesus that heals the crippled beggar at the temple gates. I'm going to talk about that for just a minute um, in a different way, something that I would not talked about before when we began this. And then what's the second act of this? The second act is preaching, right? Uh, Peter, the miracle draws a crowd, and Peter sees the opportunity, opportunity and he begins preaching. Uh, let's look at slide number two, and I want, to, I want us to camp on this just a little bit before we go any further. We are going to get into chapter four today. So he is healed, and this healing comes out of, uh, the Bible doesn't say anything about they noticed something, they saw something, there was a special whatever. The Bible doesn't say anything about that, which I think is pretty interesting, because I think if there was something like that, then you and I would say, oh, that's what I've got to look for too when God's going to do something great and powerful. And God wants us to depend on Him in faith and not look for, oh, there's this or there's that or, or, or whatever. When we are in vital union with Christ, He will do these things and more and more in our lives because we too are His disciples. So they walk in, the beggar is there, they're on their way to prayer. Um, I'm, I, I'm getting a little, little bit ahead, but it struck me as I was finishing my preparation last night. I had already written, prepared almost all my notes. In fact, this story, I said it begins with power. It doesn't really begin with power. It actually begins with prayer, right? They're going to the temple to pray. That's, that's how it starts. They're going, and this story actually does what? It ends with prayer too because they gather for a prayer meeting. So it begins with, and it ends with power as well. Begins with power, ends with power. Begins with prayer, ends with prayer. We see it all the way through. Want us to see something here. So they see this lame beggar. We've looked at this part already, and this is a story we know well. They're astounded. They rush out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade. Solomon's colonnade was not in the inner temple, but the gates, were on the outside. I'll, I'll go back and look, but uh, there were certain places people, uh, Gentiles could only go to this point. Jews could go a little bit further. Jews, male and female, could go a little bit further. Uh, if you were handicapped, according to Old Testament law, if you had certain handicaps and things like that, and it talks about that in the first five books, there you, you could not go further into the temple, which is why it's so beautiful that we see that when Jesus brings healing to this man, he comes freely into the temple. He comes into, symbolically, fellowship and relationship with God. And beloved brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus does in lives that are far from him, in lives that are broken and hurt and messed up. He restores us 
and he heals us and he brings us into fellowship with him. And there's no case that's hopeless. There's no life that's too messed up. Sometimes we think our lives or others, others' lives, it's, it's all messed up, it's impossible. An impossible case was this crippled beggar from birth, from his mother's womb, from his mother's womb. He'd never known anything else. He'd never known, he'd never known fellowship and intimacy and um, uh, in, in, in the temple courts, which, which is for them, that was the, the meaning of it, to, be, to have, to have un fellowship with God. He'd never known anything else. And there are people in this world around us, and sometimes we ourselves feel that way. I've never known anything else. All I know is broken, depending on maybe on what your family background was. Some of you have grown up in hard families, in, in tough families, maybe where there wasn't a lot of love, or things were done to you, or things were said to you, and you're wounded and you're broken, and it's hard to have fellowship with God because of that. I tell you this morning, let this true story, let it encourage your heart. Jesus heals. Jesus restores. When you get into chapter 4, I'm going to tell you now, we'll look at it next, next week. When they're standing before the council giving their defense, the man that is healed is standing with Peter and John. And Peter in verse 9 of chapter 4 says, uh, you're, he, he's giving the defense and he says something about this man whom Jesus has healed. He says something like that in verse 9 and he uses this particular word, healed. He keeps on talking and he gets to verse 12. And in verse 12, he says, there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. Do you know what? The word healed in verse 9 and the word salvation or saved in verse 12, same word. Same word. And it means wholeness and restoration. Brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus does in lives. He restores us. He heals us. He makes us whole. And this story is so much more than the healing of a crippled man. It is a picture of what Jesus does when he comes into a life. There's healing. There's restoration. There's wholeness. He brings us back into fellowship with himself. And I urge you this morning, whether for yourself or for someone else, if you say, I'm kind of like that crippled man. I, I feel like I'm not, maybe you even feel I'm not good enough. I can't because of this in my life. Jesus takes care of that. Jesus takes care of that. And he's here to do that this morning in our lives as well. So wholeness, healing, and salvation. It's interesting to me that as we look at this, and we didn't talk about this in the beginning, that Peter and John did not judge this man the way that you and I would probably, or the way that society judges this man. I want to ask you something. Would anybody in that society have said, would, would anyone have said, this is a, a pillar of the community. He is a valuable, he's a valuable member. He gives back. He is this and he's that. And, and we, we, we honor him. Would anybody in Jewish society at that time? Nobody would have. He was a beggar. He was crippled. He couldn't do anything else except beg. That was it. And honest, e honestly, even for us as Christians, is there not at times when we walk by a beggar on the streets of Hong Kong, there may be some of that in our hearts at times as well, right? When we look at, when we look at people, you kind of think, you, you make, we look at, I shouldn't say you, we, we make a judgment, we make an, a, an evaluation. This is, this is their don't get me wrong, we look and we, we, we evaluate, we, we sort of say, this is their worth, right? We, we do, we, we tend to say, this is their worth. And a lot of us, we're here in Hong Kong or whatever, a lot of times, depending on the color of our skin, depending on what we do, depending on our pocketbook, honestly, people would look at us and, may, and would also make an evaluation about us too, wouldn't they? This is your worth. And honestly speaking, that would usually be down here and not up here. What is so wonderful about this is that Peter and John, with the heart of God and the eyes of God, look at this man who would be considered fairly worthless and they don't judge him that way. Instead, they show God's mercy, grace, love, and power. 
Now, let's learn a lesson this morning. All of us, let's learn a lesson. He's one man. He does not seem valuable. He doesn't seem worth all of the attention, the miracle, the great whatever. He, he, he just doesn't seem that way. But God loves him. And through God, they touch this man. But it doesn't stop there. Because when one man is touched with the power of God and the miracle of God, it doesn't stop there. What happens after that? 2,000 more people believe. And they begin, to pr they begin to preach to the crowd. And 2,000 more men, so it's heads, they count it men, so heads of families. There would have been women in Solomon's col colonnade. They could go in that far. And children of a certain age as well. So thousands more come into eternal life and come into the family of God because of an act of kindness that began with one person. Don't judge, don't judge and don't evaluate by the person, the smallness of the, the, smallness of the act. Do what God tells you to do. Show the love that God says to show. Be the person that God says to be. You have no idea, we have no idea how much further God will take it when we're obedient with one step. As I was preparing, and that's a lesson for all of us, isn't it? Maybe that's one, maybe that's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit inspired Dr. Luke to include this. Um, when I was preparing yesterday afternoon, I went back, I was doing a little bit more searching online, and I, I went back and I was reading about a great English preacher and evangelist named Samuel Chadwick. He was born about 1860 and lived until 1930s or so. And perhaps most of you have never heard of him before. We have some of his books in the library. Wonderful man of God, full of the Holy Spirit, a man of great prayer, a man of great prayer. He was a Wesleyan Methodist minister and really a, an evangelist and a revivalist. This is what he said that I think is so appropriate for this story as well. He said that whenever he went into towns and villages to, to preach and to, to hold evangelistic crusades and, and pray for revival to come, he would pray for, in every area, in every town, he would pray for a Lazarus. He'd pray for a Lazarus. And he'd pray for a Lazarus first. Now we're saying, what? That's another story. That, that's, that's not this. This is what he meant. And when he prayed for a Lazarus, what he meant was this. God, the worst sinner in this community, the biggest drunkard, maybe he beat his family, maybe he owed debts all over, maybe his reputation was so vile that the whole town knew about it. And Samuel Chadwick would pray for a Lazarus that God would get him, would touch his heart and transform his life first, at the very beginning, not later on, first. And then it got people's attention. And then they, are, they would come. And then their hearts were open. And do you know what? God honored this faithful man's powerful and fervent prayers as he served the Lord in these years. And in almost every place, God would give him a Lazarus, the worst one. The ones that you and I run away from. We want the easy ones. This person's not so bad already, you know. They're kind of good. They're almost a Christian already. You know, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're good. They do good things. They even give money sometimes to the church. Those are the ones that we go after, right? Because um, that's easy. It's not so hard. God give us faith to pray for a Lazarus. Amen. To pray for a Lazarus. And out of that, God does something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Amen? Amen. 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 So, the crowd gathers. Part two, Paul begins what? What's the next? Fill in the blank. Preach. Okay, there's the next one. So power's the first one. Preaching is the next one. And uh, let's look at the next passage. And look how Peter, not Paul. I said Paul, didn't I? I meant Peter. You know that. I do know my Bible. <laughs> Although last time I started telling you a different story, didn't I? Peter starts preaching. And notice that he... Starts with the bad news, which seems kind of a downer, doesn't it? You killed the author of life. He starts with the bad news. They've murdered Jesus. He was the author of life. Why does he do that? 
first of all, it's in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he's not just saying, you're bad, you're a sinner. Because by the way, brothers and sisters, if that's how you start when you start sharing Jesus, uh, you're in trouble. You won't get a good response unless that's how God has told you. But Peter starts out that way because the Holy Spirit has inspired him. And they have to know, they have to know this is where they are so that they can turn around and make a change. He starts with the bad news, but he doesn't stay with the bad news. And then he gives them, next, next part, repent of your sins. Remember, repent is not, I'm sorry, I feel badly, cry a few tears, I'm, I'm, I have regret. That's not repentance. So many Christians never fully repent because I feel sorry about it, I feel badly about it, I feel guilty about it, and I cry a few tears, but I don't change. I don't turn around and go in the other direction. To turn around and go the other direction, that's repentance. And that's when there's a change. And so Peter says, you've got to repent, not just, oh, I'm so sorry I did that. So repent, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. And remember, we talked about that word wiped away before. Old manuscripts, the ink of old of the, uh, uh, that was used to write on manuscripts in the time of Peter and Paul was ink that did not have acid didn't have a lot of acid in it. And so whatever the type of manuscript, so when they were writing on it, when they were writing on the manuscript, because there was no acid in the ink or very low acid in the ink, you would write and it would be very easy just with a damp cloth or something like that, it would be very easy just to wipe. And the ink would just come up from what had been, from what had been written. So when Peter says, so that your sins may be wiped away, everybody there, they understood exactly what, they, what he meant. And they understood that that meant it's going to be wiped away. My sin isn't going to be there anymore. It's not going to be seen. It's gone and nobody's going to know it. It's not there. There's not an impression of it. There's not a shadow of it. It's gone. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does with our sins. And so they understood that. And then he says, then times of refreshment, or the NIV or the K KJV says times of refreshing, which I like a little bit better. And that means the idea is of the cool breeze that blows. It, uh, it also means take, uh, like a pause to catch your breath. And this pretty much here, Peter is actually talking about the, the, pouring, out, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Most, most Bible scholars believe that's what he's really talking about there. Then times of refreshing. Oh, brothers and sisters, don't you find it in your life when you've waited on the Lord and, and God really pours out the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life again? It's such a refreshing, isn't it? It's such a refreshing. Sometime in times of worship, when the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts and our lives, like this morning as we were singing, and especially as we were singing, you are good, good, all of that. Well, I could just feel, it was like the wind of the Holy Spirit just refreshing us, empowering us, and lifting us up again. That's what he does. And he says, when you do that, times of refreshing will come, he'll send you Jesus. So the bad news and the good news, and the good news. And all of that comes about because they didn't ignore a crippled beggar that was a nobody seated by the gates. God knows what he's doing God, as God touches people. And we see the response, Acts 4.4. 4. Next slide. How many people believe? What's the number now? Uh, work on your math. How many people believe? Do you remember from Acts chapter 2? So how many more men, we should say? You're scared to say, aren't you? We're always scared to give math answers in church. 2,000, <laughs> okay? So on the day of Pentecost, about 3,000. And when he say 5,000 here, that means basically about 2,000 more men or households. So it would have been more than that are added. Do you know, if you'll read through the book of Acts, this is the last time a number like this is given in the growth of the church. Do you know why? I think it's just growing everywhere. That's what I think. Um, the church starts growing everywhere, and so many are coming into the church, and the church is growing that no more numbers are given. But here it says, so now it comes to about, comes to about 5,000. Now we come to Act 3 and Act 4 of this story. A miracle has been performed in the name of Jesus, and here's the great thing. They've done a good deed. Now, next slide. While they're speaking to the people, they're confronted by the priests, captain of the temple guards, some of the Sadducees. They're disturbed because of the preaching. They're preaching about resurrection. 
and they're preaching about Jesus. Two things that the Sadducees and the priests don't want to hear. Do you know why? This is the group that arrested and tried and condemned Jesus, the one they're preaching about. This group also, the Sadducees, did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees, is a, they're a smaller group, and if you've got your notes, you'll see that's on the front. You can look now or you can look later. The Sadducees were a group similar to the Pharisees, but they were more political, than, and they held a lot of power. They tended to be landowners, aristocratic and wealthy, and generally they were friends with Rome so that they could stay in power. The high priest and the high priestly family and the upper levels of the priests all came from the Sadducees and they controlled the area of the temple. So the captain of the temple guard, he would have been a Sadducee and most, many of the priests, the priests there were Pharisees as well, but most of them, many of the higher levels, um, the high priest when Jesus was, was tried and crucified was a Sadducee and we'll read about him very, very shortly. But this is the group, so number one, they're preaching about Jesus, not a name that they want to hear. Number two, they're talking about resurrection. We don't believe that. Number three, who are Peter and John to be preaching and teaching in the temple? You're a nobody. You're a fisherman. You're from Galilee. Those are bad things. And you're not even very educated. In fact, the word that is used a little bit later means illiterate. Now later on we know at least that Peter was literate enough to write because we read 1 Peter and 2 Peter. But you know what? His Greek was really, really bad. It never got much better. I mean, it was, it was, it was rough Greek, not like Paul, polished and educated. So all of these things they're not who what authority do they have to come into our temple and preach about Jesus and so they come up and for the good deed what happens they arrest them put them in jail until morning because it's evening according to Jewish law you can't have a trial at night of course that didn't bother them when they arrested Jesus did it because the trial was by night but in this case, they follow their own laws. So they put them in jail until morning. Now, if you're looking at your notes, I've given you a whole list of those who oppose Peter and John. And I've said they are the very ones who arrested Jesus. And I want us to, I want us to think about this a little bit further. If you were Peter and John, what would you be thinking and what would you be feeling that evening as you are arrested and as you are thrown into jail? Now, please don't lie to me and say, ha, no problem. I'd be bold, and I'd be saying, oh, God, you're going to get... They didn't know that. So imagine, this is a true story, and Peter and John are real people, and they're not floating above the ground with halos and things like that. Peter and John are people as we are people. And I want you to think with me what they were facing, because you and I also when we stand for the Lord, when we serve Him, when we walk through our days, you and I face opposition, we face enemies, we fa face those that stand against us because we want to be honest, we want to be right. Remember I told you that story years and years ago after I'd finished graduate school, I'd, we'd gone over with my sister to, a, to, a, to, to somebody's house, a group of people were gathered, and they was, there was a barbecue, and then they started showing a movie. And uh, or a, I think it was a comedy performance or something like that, and it was a, and I, I didn't know, you know, I was I was with my sister and we were sitting there, and the this comedy performance, this recorded comedy performance started. It was the vilest. I'd never heard language like that before. It was one of the vilest things. It was an early Eddie Murphy, whatever. It was awful. I mean, it was awful. And I sat. I remember sitting there thinking, and I'm I'm not a goody two shoes. I'm really not. But I sat there and I just thought. <gasps> I felt the Holy Spirit in me grieved and offended by the words coming out and the things that were being said. And I just leaned over to my sister and I said, I, I, can't, I can't watch this. Didn't make a big deal about it. Didn't, didn't say, oh, this is terrible. I didn't do that. It was very quiet. I just said, I can't. we've got to go. And, and so we quietly said, oh, we need to go. And we got up quietly and left. And we didn't make a scene. And, I, I, and then we met these other people later on. They were, you know, we were in the same whatever. And the wife of the home, as I remember me telling you this story, 
she was so unfriendly and just hateful. And I didn't know what was wrong. I thought, what have I done? I didn't say anything to her. We, have I done something to, to offend? I said, Becky, have we done what? I really had no idea. And it was months later that we found out that when we had gotten up to leave, it had offended her. It offended her because we had not stayed to watch this. And, and she, she never did smile at us. I mean, it, it, never, it, never, it never made it. It was never okay. And you know what, brothers and sisters? You know, now you can offend a lot of people if you want to be a goody two-shoes and just say, oh, that's so bad, I don't like that. There's, you don't need that. Just be real in who you are. But I will tell you this. As you live for God in your work, it may be something as, as little as turning away or not laughing when somebody tells a joke that is off color or it's not kind or, or whatever. I'm not saying it's this or this or this. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Or you just want to be honest and upright. You are going to offend people who are not the people of God. It's going to happen. And there will be opposition. There will be laughter. There will be mockery. There will be... You will make enemies. That's the way it is. So go ahead and settle it now. Go ahead and settle it now. That's how it's going to be. So Peter and John are facing this. And I want us to think about this. Um, it was an offense. They're in the jail until morning. And I want to challenge you to look up something in your Bibles. Not at this moment. As I was studying yesterday afternoon, I went back to this part. The priest, the captain of the temple guard. And I thought, hmm, the captain of the temple guard. So I went back and I did some reading. Guess what? Think with me. You go all the way back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you know where you find the captain of the temple guard? Because of the shortness of the time, it is almost a guarantee that it's the same person. Almost a guarantee. He was the one that led the soldiers that night in the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. This man. This man. And he's the same one that a short time later arrests and, and, and jails the disciples of Jesus, Peter and John. I wonder what was going through their minds. It was serious. This was a big deal. This was the one who had arrested Jesus. They had already shown that they were willing to put to death their ma the master, Jesus. And the same could be said of them as well. So they're put in prison, and then let's look at the next thing. The next morning, or the next day, let's go to the next. The council of the rulers and elders and the teachers. Give me another name for this. What's another name? A council is New Living Translation and maybe NIV. You've got, if you've got a King James or an older trans, uh, a, a more formal translation, give me another word for this. It's the group of 70, the Sanhedrin. Okay, so it's 70, actually it's 71. It's 70 of the leading priests and so on, plus the high priest. So 71, the high priest led the, led the Sanhedrin or the council. Now, stay with me, because I'm talking about enemy and opposition and persecution. Persecution is the third part. Persecution is what you and I run from, isn't it? How many of you pray for no persecution? I do. How many of you, when it gets hard and tough and tight and squeezed, oh, Lord, deliver me? We do. We're human, and that, that's part of it. But let's, let's see what Peter and John do. Stay with me, and let's look at the people now that we're going to meet. It's the Sanhedrin, Annas the high priest, but in fact, they called him the high priest because he had so much power. He's actually not the high priest. The high priest actually is... Caiaphas, his son-in-law, okay? And in fact, even at the time of Jesus' arrest and the trial, Caiaphas was the high priest at that time, but Annas still held all the power. Annas was a wicked, ungodly, powerful priest that worked to keep all the power, all the influence in his own hands. He was high priest for about 10 years. Then when they deposed him, when the Roman government deposed him, he personally made his son-in-law high priest. And then sometime during that time while he was still alive, he made five of his sons also the high priest at various times. And then he was still hanging around and finally he made one of his grandsons high priest as well. 
ungodly man holding on to power in the way that the world holds, holds on to power. Stay with me. So here's Caiaphas and here's Annas, and they are part of this group that is gathered to deal with the two disciples. Okay? What opposition do you face? What enemies do you face? Look at who they faced. And stay with me as we think about this. Have Peter and John ever come across Caiaphas and Annas before? They're nobodies, you know, they're just disciples. Go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look at the night that Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest. I wonder if they remembered Peter. What are you thinking? They may have remembered this guy, this hothead. They were there in the garden. All of the disciples flee except which two? Which two? Peter and John. That's right. Peter and, that's right. Peter and John. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. It's not by chance. Now they face the two they face the people, and the two especially, that their master faced that night, Annas and Caiaphas. John was a relative in some way of the high priest. He was in closer, but Peter was in the courtyard, and the trial and the mockery and the persecution of Jesus was seen at least in part by John and Peter. They saw it. They saw it. But I think it was no surprise to them that they too now were facing persecution because Jesus said, don't be surprised. They persecuted me, they'll persecute you. I wanna ask you something this morning. Are you surprised when persecution hits you? I am. Like that time I told you about that at that party and then, she, and then they were so, and that, oh, that was nothing. She just wasn't friendly. What kind of persecution is that? You know, baby persecution. But it, it, it was like, because you know, I think I'm friendly and I think I'm a nice person and it hurt me. Well, she doesn't like me. She's not my friend, you know? And we're, we're like that, aren't we? We, we? we really are. We get surprised by opposition. We get surprised by persecution. We are surprised and hurt when people are, are offended by our Christian life, whether we say something or not. Brothers and sisters, we take the words of Jesus into our heart this morning when he says to his disciples, to you and to me, don't be surprised when they do this. They did it to me, they'll do it to you. They'll do it to you. But here we see the promise of Jesus in such circumstances and in such times. They bring them in and they demand and they ask the perfect question. It's the perfect question. I love it when non-Christians ask me questions. Now, I do study because I want to know, because some questions are hard to answer, right? Has somebody ever asked you a hard question? Me too. <laughs> me too. The promise of God is that he will help us. I do think we should study, and I do think we should learn, Lord, how do I answer this? But there are times when you and I can't prepare. We've just got to have the Holy Spirit. We've got to be full of the Holy Spirit in vital union with Him. And the promise of God is that He is with us. And what I have found is this. Persecution and opposition, the things and enemies, the things that you and I run from, we run from, we pray against, we don't want it, are the very situations and circumstances and times when there can be the greatest and most powerful witness and testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we see here. It's true. It's true. And so I want to encourage you, if it comes, you don't have to pray for it, don't worry, because it will come. Um, let, let the Lord handle that. But if it does, don't run. Don't say, oh God, get me out of this. Instead, say, God, keep me. <laughs> keep me. Stand be full of the Holy Spirit and let the Lord use you in that persecution, in that opposition, in that circumstance, that there might be a proclamation of God in that place. Because they ask the perfect question. They ask, I I've told you before, years ago, when Northwest was still an airline company, they are no longer an airline company. It was, I was flying back to the U.S. and 
miracle of miracles, they bumped me up to business class. <sighs> it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And so I was up in business class and this guy sat down next to me and he started, he was drinking. I think he wanted to make it across the ocean. So he was just drink, just drinking away, really, really drinking, but he wasn't unfriendly or whatever. And so, so he looked at me and we, you know, said hello and whatever. And he said, he said, what do you, you know, uh, may I ask? Oh, you live in Hong Kong. Oh, what do you do? And sometimes I'm careful about how I share because it just freaks people out. Sometimes I say, I work with the church rather than I'm a pastor, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I really felt, so I just spoke whatever. And he looked at me and says, oh. And I thought, well, here it comes. <laughs> here it comes. And he looked at me. And sometimes, so he asked me a question, I answered it. And these days, honestly, when somebody asks me a question, I just think, okay, they ask me a question, I can ask them a question. It's fair, right? And, I, and often these days, but my heart is prepared, when they ask me something, I'll ask them, oh, do, do you believe in God? Right? It's great. They've already opened the door, as, these, as the opponents did right here. And um, he asked me a tough question, because I'd asked him something, and he said, I, I don't, he said, well, I used to be whatever, he says, but really, he says, I'm, I'm an agnostic, really, I'm kind of an atheist, I don't really, I, I, don't, I don't believe anything anymore. I said, oh, and then he asked a really tough question. And you know what? It wasn't one that I'd prepared for, but the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit at that moment and gave me the words to say. And it wasn't a big, huge thing, and I didn't shout at him, and I didn't say, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. Though he was a sinner and he was going to hell if he didn't have Jesus. But you know, the Holy Spirit could do that. I, I, and I'm not, please understand, I'm not making light or fun of that. Do you understand? Because, the Holy, because God loved him. And I think God loved him, and so he put that man who was an atheist and had lost his belief and was drinking very heavily, he put him next to me on the plane because he loved him, because he loved him. So I got to get in business class because God loved that man, really. And, and I, the Lord gave me the answer for him. And I didn't lead him to salvation right then, but the Lord gave me the answer for him and he said, well, I haven't thought about it that way. Well, you're right. And then, and then we just talked a little bit and, and I prayed for him since then and I trust he has come to the Lord. Don't be afraid of persecution and opposition when it comes. Don't run, but be ready, but be ready, as Peter and John were. And when the question comes, I'm sorry, I was going to stop before. I just see that it's 105. I wasn't going to keep you this long. We're going to finish this up next week. Let's close with this. The opposition brings the opportunity for great testimony for great testimony. And we close with this. Andres, just give me the next slide. And I just want you to look at this, just this word, and we close with this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, we stop here. The promise of God to you is, as you're walking in vital union with Him, in your time of need, when you don't know what to say, when you don't know what to do, when there is opposition against you, when you have nothing in yourself, remember, they're not educated. They're not trained. And they're with the br most brilliant minds of Jerusalem, the highest education, the Harvards, the Oxfords, the whatever. And they've barely gone to school. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit fills you, equips you, and empowers you, there is no opposition that can overcome. There is no enemy that is greater. There is no situation that will wipe you out because He's God. He's God. We close with that this morning. Let's just cl close. Thank you for your patience. Let's just close very briefly in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for Peter and John because God, we're kind of like them but you filled them with your Holy Spirit as they were in vital union with you. Lord, may we too, may we too walk in the same way. And Lord, I pray for Lighthouse. Lord, I pray for everyone who's seated here right now. When they face opposition, when they face people who laugh at them or mock them or treat them unfairly just because they can, Lord, I pray, fill them with your Spirit. Fill your people with your Spirit that what flows out is not anger, is not 
a hurt defense, self-defense, but Lord, that what flows out is you. It's you in power and in might. And there will be no question that it's you, that it's you. For we are your people. We are your people. Thank you, God, for this story. Thank you for Peter and John. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity when opposition and persecution comes our way that we might be your people and stand for you and speak for you and be filled with your spirit in such times. In your precious, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.